Okay, I'm back live and uh, totally apologize, right? So I'm getting spotty Wi-Fi. It's probably, so IAPA attracts 32,000 people. Anyway, I was saying, uh, my tag actually says non-member buyer, but I'm not necessarily buying anything, but it's a classification they have at IAPA. Um, whoa. Uh, I was thinking we could just have this toucan playing for like 30 minutes. I don't know. I find it very hypnotic at some level. <laughs> Again, all the new technologies you see at IAPA. Um, oh, but in any case, I was saying, I think I was telling a story. Uh, we, um, this morning, had a panel. Uh, with uh, Gordon Grice from Forak and uh, myself and then Joel Beckerman from uh, Man Made Music. Uh, you could check uh, Joel's work out in the upcoming uh, Melissa McCarthy movie. Uh, I think it's called Food Fest. It's a food uh, competition themed movie and uh, he did the uh, soundtrack for it and he talked today about uh, sonic branding and some of the stuff he does at Man Made which is a company uh, based out of New York. Um, so we talked about the senses. We talked about the value of using the senses, so sight, sound, touch, smell, in um, themed and immersive spaces. By the way, we have Trio Tech's booth, and it's one of the biggest this, year's, this year. Uh, they just did the Fear of the Walking Dead survival uh, experience. Uh, if you go to my YouTube page, I do a walkthrough. I was able to get a uh, press pass to uh, visit that in Las Vegas. They're doing a mini version of it today. What's cool about the Trio Tech approach is they've combined a series of different uh, forms of entertainment and attraction in one space. So you have escape room technology, you have the VR stuff. Um, what they're showing is not exactly what you see um, in the attraction, but it would be the ending, um, what people are queuing for, it's the ending um, of the attraction where you basically uh, put on 3D glasses and you uh, have a gun and it's a, a video game with some three-dimensional technology. Again, keeping with the theme of what is going on these days, you see you know, physical stuff um, in the attraction industry, but the VR stuff is so much more popular. And I think it's, uh, to some degree, maybe a turning point in the industry because the question becomes, do you abandon um, you know, the physicality of old roller coasters and, and the fun of being thrown around by them uh, and replace that with stuff like this up here. And, you know, these are cool rides. I hope to ride some of them later. But the issue becomes, are you relying too much on the technology, you know, as, as part of the experience? It looks really fun though, right? And it looks like, yeah, they've got some kind of Oculus glasses going. I mean, this is, uh, this is the future. Like I said, from 2015 till two years later, um, it's about a three-fold increase, maybe more, in terms of just number of companies exhibiting at IAPA that are using VR, augmented reality, um, some technology to take a ride and to transform it. Uh, recently, I did an interview on the leading broadcasting company, CBC, about nostalgia and rides, and I made this same point there, basically, that we're seeing maybe the end or the shift away from the physicality of rides, the kinetics of them, the physicality of them, and in terms of your body getting thrown around, and moving into this virtual realm. And I think there's great possibilities. In our session this morning, I talked about this a little bit and said, I talked to a really um, interesting designer, a student who was asking me, you know, what do you think about um, 4D or 5D experiences and rides? And I said, hey, you know, they're great, but you need to make sure you're not sacrificing, it's a little loud here, sorry, you're not sacrificing the story, um, the narrative, what you're trying to express for um, the technology itself. Like the technology cannot stand on its own just for the sake of technology because then I think you lose that storytelling that we've come to associate with uh, Disney. If you didn't see before, just because it's real cool, for the thousands of people watching out there. We've got the American Ninja Warrior competition. Um, my father-in-law would certainly love this because he's way into the show. 
And uh, it's kind of, you know, this is pretty cool though. Like having something on a mini scale like Ninja Warrior, and this is not, you know, connected to the official show um, that I can tell. I don't think that's a, a trademark thing, but don't quote me on that. But, you know, it's kind of fun just having this uh, for kids and it gets the family involved. You get a ton of people who come out to IAPA, either they are um, part of the show, they're part of, you know, one of the uh, panels like ours this morning, or they just come up the street and pay because they want to experience um, all the new rides and attractions. And I think it's just really fun. I love the booths that have a lot more going on. You see these guys here, costume characters and stuff dressed up. So it's a really fun thing. Um, but you get everything here. And one of the things you can do is try out games. So. You can try out games for free. Terrible, terrible shot. I'm trying to hold the camera and make a basket. Alright, I got one. Um, yeah, but that's you know one of the fun things about IAPA is there are no limits on uh, what you can do. The question becomes what is this? So let's see, it's a water gun. And uh, maybe maybe it just is constantly going. I don't know. Okay. Uh, maybe I have to hit the target or do something with the ducks. I don't know. I don't know. Is that does that look fun? I mean, I think one of the things is you're trying to use um, the latest technologies to get people interested, obviously, in your. Uh, in your products here, but you know where else do you get to do this, right? This doesn't happen at uh, academic conferences. Trade shows are all about um, getting to try the latest and greatest technologies, games, rides, whatever. Um, you know, some of this, I think, again, we think of it as pure amusement, but um, the other side of it is a lot of creative minds, uh, teams, you know, are involved in. I think this is just. Maybe throw the ball and the, I, I don't even know what this is. Is it registering a score? I don't know. It kind of is, but it seems too easy. Oh wait, they're moving. Okay, okay, hold on. Now, here we go. All right, now it's harder because the cute penguins are, are moving. All right, I don't know. Let's see. We have Graveyard Smash. Now this could be, I'm hoping, yeah, okay, so this is interesting. Um, we're seeing, of course, a lot of VR stuff, um, virtual reality, of course, but what I like is they're bringing physicality back to games. So this is an example of using, right, the traditional carnival game with a ball. And this is actually really fun. Whoa. All right. <laughs> um, there's a, if I get a chance later, I'm gonna show you a Pong. Whoa, I just got stung or something. There's a new version of Atari Pong, the classic old uh, video game, but they incorporate um, like magnets and actual three-dimensional real um, moving pieces on the Pong board. So I actually like this because I think there's a bit of a throwback to the nostalgia of carnival games, but you have the fun of the sound, you have the interactivity, you have the scoring uh, with games. Um, the world of video games, if you've uh, studied them, which I've done a little research on video games, you know, there's an evolution over time. There's more connection of we're getting, we have to kill that thing in the middle, the ghost. Um, but you know, the games themselves are changing. Uh, I mentioned yesterday in my live cast, or two days ago, that didn't work so well, that the, the person who comes to a theme park or a mini golf course or who wants to experience um, something, their, their expectation has changed over time. So I don't think we can any longer use, rely on old technologies, other than to say, you know, there's some nostalgia to it. Um, but as you look at any of the new examples of attractions, rides here at IAPA. And I think you have to remember that this really shows you sort of 
you know, a snapshot of where the industry is, where it has been, maybe where it's headed. Um, so for someone like me, again, I come here to uh, present at IAPA. Uh, you know, I'm also doing, it seems like research, just because there are opportunities to, uh, to study the new technologies. You know, so for me, it's an invaluable opportunity to come out here, to talk with people, to network a little bit, and to get a better sense of uh, what's happening in, Amer not American, world amusements, really. The other thing you're going to find at IAP, and I love this stuff, is uh, the mini dioramas. You get the mini versions of roller coasters. You get, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff, which, which, again, I think shows you the artistry behind this. Um, critics who, who write about, like, theme parks or spaces of amusement, um, often forget you know that so much to make one mock-up one model like this right just think of all the artistry that goes into this right I mean we forget about just that level of oh, sorry <laughs> I, I think maybe they I, you know sometimes they come to a booth and someone doesn't want to <laughs> doesn't want me live casting or whatever um, you never know and um, so, some companies are, are kind of particular about that and I've noticed signs that say uh, no photos or whatever, which, by the way, I was mentioning this to uh, my colleague Gordon this morning after we uh, presented. I said, if you put one of those signs up there, and this is a fabrication company. They do, like, uh, looks like environmental type um, scenes for, uh, you know, attraction venues. But, you know, why would you ever put a sign up on your ride or your company, whatever you're, you're highlighting at, at IAPA, that says no photos? Just, just think about this for a second. We live in the world of social media. We live in the world of viral marketing. We live in the world in which, if I had one of these companies, I would be like, please take photos. Please post them on Instagram. Post them, oh, we got a, uh, not part of attraction, but it looks like a uh, therapy dog or a um, dog of some sort, a service dog. Now, Mac Rides, if you know about Mac Rides, they are truly a leader, and this is like, that's what you you know. That's what you call a showstopper in terms of we get around here to get a better view. Well, we got a, like a, a steampunk aesthetic going on here. I mean, that's just really quite amazing. Yeah, Mac, uh, Gen, you know, truly one of the uh, world leaders in. Uh, Ride design. This gives you a little bit of their um, history with the Mack family, if you know about Europa Park in uh, Germany. This takes you through the whole timeline. This this shows you, really, doesn't it, the history that's involved here, right, coming from the 1780s, moving all the way through 2016. All the highlights, all the major ride technologies, the advances and stuff. And that's really when you really see in, in a display like this or a booth like Mack. Um, you get uh, again get the artistry behind we're at great coasters now I just love the little mini versions here you kind of get immersed in the experience um, but yeah when you when you see displays of these rides you really do see that there's a, a history behind them Robert Cartmel the famous um, art historian I believe uh, wrote, I, I think, still the classic book on roller coasters, Great American Screen Machine. I think I have it right. If not, correct me. Um, but he really does look at the ride as something more than just a conveyance that moves people in space and is fun and entertaining. But it is actually, um, so I'm thinking here, is this, is that the guy from Thor? And is that Steven Spielberg? I don't know. Can we try, let's see here. Maybe. Okay, let's flip the camera around. Okay, I don't, I don't know. Is that that? I, I think it's, it's like the uh, Madame Tussauds, right? Um, wait, that says Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Why did I think that was... Okay. It's Ryan Reynolds. See, I thought it was the guy... Uh, who plays Thor? I didn't know Ryan Reynolds. What are some of his films? Help me out. Um, but in any case, you know, when you see what's what's happening in IAPA, you're just you feel like you're in the presence of just all this creativity because people who aren't in the industry don't realize 
you know, everything that goes into the fabrication, not even the fabrication, if I show you the Goddard uh, booth later, they describe the four, um, the four aspects of, of a project, you know, so the, the first phase is like getting into, um, you know, conceptualizing and trying to think up what would be a great attraction. And then maybe later, you know, you get into fabrication and then down the road, of course, you're talking about operation, execution, and also um, the, um, you know, ke keeping current and making sure that your attractions um, are still doing what they've done for the guests uh, in the past. Here's the uh, Forac booth. I'll give them a shout out. That's some sort of fog going on here, the Mac Ride booth. Uh, but Forac, uh, this is Gordon Grice's um, firm. And they always do, uh, this year they got prime, prime real estate. This is about as in the middle, we're at the 2700. So, I mean, they're totally prime real estate in terms of um, a booth at IAPA. And so what, um, you know, what's key is for the, the bigger firms is that when you have a booth like this, prime real estate, you really do um, depend on, and you see all the, the various seats um, around here, what the bigger firms do is they will have client meetings, right? So they actually um, will, you know, meet with folks and discuss projects, discuss opportunities. So I don't know the price of um, a booth like the Forac booth, but I will tell you that it isn't cheap. And so as a result, you know, you're, you're very reliant on uh, connecting with clients and, uh, you know, hopefully getting some opportunities to work with them in the future. Here's some of their project stuff on the side. One of the things if you study theme parks is you could certainly um, get another dinosaur here. Mouth camera. <laughs> Hopefully I don't get kicked out if someone doesn't like me uh, filming stuff. I'll just say I'm Skyping. How's that? Uh, there's a ropes course maybe? Yeah. So if someone says anything, I'm just going to claim that I'm Skyping all the while. Um, but yeah, so if you are a firm and you have, you know, a big footprint and you're spending a lot on a booth, I think there's a, a pretty high expectation to uh, drum up some clients uh, while at IAPA. Here's, uh, is it four or five days of the trade show? Um, so, you know, you, you, you definitely want people to stop by your booth. Now there's everything at um, IAPA. Look at this. I mean, there you, you've got functional stuff. Um, I, I, there there isn't a category that you could name that that isn't represented um, at IAPA, and it's just the nature of the industry, right? The very functional stuff, sound hubs, um, all the entry devices, you know, like Disney Plus that we know about. Um, now this one, I was live casting the other day, and. Uh, I know, I did the other day. So we're at 3278, and I was really saying that this is like one of the coolest 3D, and, and unfortunately you can't see it out there because uh, you need the glasses, but if you're at IAPA, come by 3278 because it, it really is, in the, in the sense of the depth that's created in this three-dimensional technology, uh, it's like unlike anything I've seen in the past. And I've been, a, I think in terms of you know immersive film stuff, uh, somewhat of a critic of 3D as being too gimmicky, but when it gets to this level, um, it, it really is something new and unique. And I don't think there's any way that, no, there's no way. I was looking at the glasses thinking I could put, I, I don't think that's gonna work, but uh, come out to 3278 um, at the IAPA booth and please check it out because it is absolutely um, amazing, amazing, amazing. It's like the best 3D I've seen. And so if they keep doing that, we've got holograms here to the right. That's pretty cool. Um, nothing is, is not cool, right? Here's more VR stuff. We're going to see so much of that. Uh, interactive screens. Uh, I, you know, I was at Mandalay Bay at a part of their Polar um, Express experience, and this kind of uh, technology where you interact with screens in real time was a big part of that experience. And so that, that's, I think, another sign of how we can have some of the old and the new, so we can have interactivity, um, the new technology, but don't just make it so, you know, reliant on technology as a gimmick, basically. Um, there is no order to this, I'm just wandering around. The frogs, fro or froggy's fog, that's kind of interesting. I was walking by that earlier with Gordon. Um, they have food here. 
Um, you know, the food booths are okay. It's probably what you expect at a convention. I had some $11 uh, Peruvian meal today, and it was okay. So Now, this thing here, you know, Gordon and I were trying to ask them what they do, and they weren't, they didn't have a, a greeter, so I don't know. We won't try to uh, interact with them. But it's like green, and it's some sort of... Um, fog machine and it's it's almost like that um, spray sort of bubble stuff maybe maybe it's a foam base it dissipates after a while but when they add the green to it it gives you may, maybe it'll, it'll get going here I don't know there's not a lot happening but wait there's maybe there's a sound okay there's something going on up there I don't know if, uh, does Facebook, like YouTube, pull out, you got so much copyrighted music, what have we got, Tears for Fears, that um, I'm always worried, you know, like on YouTube, if I'm recording on site at a theme park, um, you know, I'm going to get knocked by the uh, YouTube sensors, right? So I don't know if that's going to happen on Facebook. I assume this gets archived. If it doesn't, then um, the, the uh, thousand of you watching, you're the only ones who are ever going to see this walkthrough. Um, what else do we have going on here? Let's see. Uh, oh, customizable uh, ride vehicles. Okay. So I guess the idea here is they do fabrication and, um, you know, you could basically create, it looks like a vehicle based on the theme. If you're doing a dinosaur theme or a race car or whatever, you could have that customized, which is certainly um, a cool idea, right? So you can make it fit. You know, the customization, and I, I know nothing about that level of um, engineering, but I'm you know, wondering about like 3D printing. And if you can use 3D printing now in, in, in new ways and more cost-effective ways. Um, this, by the way, this big game, um, I'm not gonna make you wait in line. If there was no line, we'd go in. But you know, I, I saw something on LinkedIn, I think, and this looked actually pretty cool. So I think we're gonna have to, or we, me, we're gonna have to check this out later just to see the experience. It looked like a walkthrough, um, you know, shoot 'em up game, video base, and, and so forth. You can see some of the screen there, right? So there's people shooting, but it looked really innovative. And uh, they typically at IAPA have walked through these uh, mock-ups. They typically do small versions of rides, like the Fear the Walking Dead experience um, is not obviously the full experience. What they try to do is give you a flavor. Now, in a couple cases, or a couple cases, many cases. These are the full, right? So this would be a full ride experience. Um, gun themed, of course. So. Giant bugs. Get the idea <laughs> but uh, yeah you know so it's it, it's pretty easy right when a lot of cases if you just get to experience the actual ride you know it's not a mock-up or anything I think that allows you to see exactly what you're getting into if you decide to go ahead with a purchase or something or a contract um, if I show you the inflatables the big balloon um, you know blow up stuff uh, in those cases you actually see like price tags on some of the rides they have sales there's a a uh, firm out here that sells used rides. This looks to be like a karaoke. Um, you know, I think this whole technology here we have to watch in the future. I, I'm very suspicious now. You know, maybe karaoke is still a thing, like culturally. But um, the photo printing technologies, when I see booths for that, and I'm going to offend anyone who's, uh, you know, represented from that industry, but I just wonder if that can sustain itself. If you're going to sell people physical printouts, of their photos from social media or whatever. So I think that's an example where you, you do have to um, keep up with the times or you will become obsolescent. You will basically, you know, uh, just ride yourself right out of the industry, right? Because people are not going to um, accept some of those technologies that, that become old over time or outdated. This is pretty amazing, huh? These are. Um, mock-ups but just look at the the detail and the quality of some of this wow 
This is this is pretty uh, amazing. Let's see where we're at and. Uh, Uh, it reminds me a little bit, right, when you watch, um, there's still films out there. I know the new Blade Runner 2049, which if you could make it through the three hours, uh, it has some pretty amazing cinematography and some pretty uh, innovative uh, set stuff. I saw that they actually did some of this, you know, like what they did with Star Wars, um, with matte paintings, and then also these uh, miniature versions. You can do some amazing things with camera and perspective, and it's something I think that we shouldn't lose sight of, thinking that, well, the stuff is outdated or whatever. Now, what do we have here? We have another uh, ride of some sort. Uh, the, you know, at IAPA, you get a lot of, um, I guess, swag, right? Uh, uh, bags and stuff, uh, souvenirs you can pick up and take with you, um, flash drives, uh, pens, of course, you know, almost like a, a fair at any trade fair. Um, So yeah, I mean, what I haven't ridden, we had a little cut out there, haven't ridden this, but this is a uh, brass wing ring winner. The brass uh, ring is a really uh, prestigious award that's uh, given out at IAPA. And um, so it's, you know, uh, an indication that you've done something successful. So this appears to be one of the newer rides where you have a physical component, so people are moving in real time, and then you have, of course, uh, the Oculus, uh, the, don't quote me, they might, may not be Oculus, it's almost like a Kleenex, right? It like becomes generic, but, um, you know, VR technology that involves um, projecting on, uh, you know, uh, the screen, if you will, your eyes, um, an experience, and you, in some cases, can interact with that experience. In this case, you're not, doesn't look like able to, uh, you know, actually have an interactive component like a shooting game or something. Um, you know, few of the firms you see here, if they just have a big space and meeting tables, you know, I think that often says something about, um, you know, their goals at IAPA. It's maybe not to sell something per se or to demo something. In some cases, even you have design firms that don't demo their creations, which I think indicates a little bit. Here's a price tag, actually first price tag we've seen. Another one, everything for sale. So you do see things actually for sale. Um, at IAPA. Oh, this one I want to show you. This, if I'm giving out awards, I don't know, I'm not giving out awards, but this would be up there. Dynamic Attractions. Um, so this is pretty outstanding. There's another one down the way that's a mini candy shop. Um, but check this out, right? Check out the level of theming here. Actually, this one isn't too shabby either. Uh, the experience here, ropes course. But, you know, when, when the when they go through, sorry about the cutout, an effort like this, I mean, you, you can really, you know, tell they're, they're very serious. And that's one of the things, if you have a display like that, right, you, you're pretty much indicating to the world, to the industry, that you're a serious player, right? I mean, you are serious about your design, your attraction, or whatever that happens to be. Um, we're getting cut out, but it seems like we have some pretty good, uh, we've been having some pretty good luck here with... Uh, with the Wi-Fi, I think we just lost one viewer, so we're down to 999 viewers, uh, maybe. Okay, we're back. Um, I was just trying to, like, I shut the phone off and thought maybe the trick of restarting it would get me on a better Wi-Fi. So y you notice throughout um, IAPA they have uh, various... Um, you know, speaker uh, sections, and so uh, in this particular case, it looks like you know there's going to be um, an event today or or something. Uh, one of the things they do is they um, do ride reveals, and some of the ride reveals are um, pretty exciting. Like there was one they did, which was a, um, a Sea World one yesterday. I actually saw on the local news. So, and here is IAPA Central, and uh, you know I have to say. IAPA is like, uh, you know, they recently moved to Orlando for their headquarters, and IAPA does such a, a stellar job just with everything. We had like five people um, from IAPA this morning at our session. We had um, three tech people. We had maybe three other people helping us with uh, the room, with the evaluations, with the announcements, and so they do just a stellar, stellar job. Now, I wanted to mention a little plug here on our... Um, so Gordon, uh, Joel, and I did our session this morning, and we have a new piece that came out in Attractions Management on uh, sensory design. So we'll take a look at that, actually. And um, 
gonna try to find a seat somewhere. Just to show you this, let me use this. So um, Attractions Management uh, out of the UK, they do an amazing uh, magazine. And um, this year we, or this quarter, we contributed and our piece came out just around the time of um, two weeks before IAPA. So it's kind of cool just because what we were talking about this morning was also you know the same topic focusing on the senses a sensory design. So again, in, in case uh, you want to connect uh, Joel Beckerman from Man Made, Gordon Grice, and myself. Um, so this particular piece talked about each of the five senses and using them in uh, spatial design. And they did a great job with the article. At the end, we talk about um, co combining the senses and ways to utilize the senses um, in some multi-sensory well, multi ways, I guess, for lack of a better word. So uh, check that out if you are at IAPA, the latest uh, attractions management. They have many copies and also pick up, you know, all the other great industry magazines, um, in Park Magazine, Fun World. There are a lot of trade publications here. They're not all um, at this uh, section here, the industry publications. You'll find them sometimes on the, uh, the floor as well. Um, so yeah, you can come to IAPA Central. They have a charging station for your phones and stuff, which is pretty necessary. I've been like just running out of uh, juice lately, and I think it could be the new operating system on the iPhone. I don't know, I'm suspicious. You see some of the uh, publications here as well. Filming going on. There's, there's always, you know, something. I saw there was a, uh, there are news crews that come out, local news crews generally. I don't think we get the national folks out, but with the uh, ride reveals, you know, it's kind of a big deal. Like with SeaWorld, there was a lot of interest in what they were coming out with, and their particular ride is a new version of a uh, water ride, a shoot the shoots or something like a rapids water ride. These are some sort of some sort of like hoverboard or something another that uh, syncs with the sound, I guess. So, um, you know, if you if you come to IAPA, you could spend uh, the better part of the day. They have you know concessions, restrooms, of course, all the typical stuff. Um, but it's pretty. Actually, I will say Tuesday was a little busier. I think just in general, it was a little harder to um, circumnavigate. The floor uh, just seemed more crowded, so sometimes that varies, right, with uh, what's going on upstairs at the panels, what's happening with um, uh, you know edgy tours as they call as they call them. And edgy tours are really unique. They will take you behind the scenes of attractions. They will take you to. I did uh, a couple years ago the Legoland Hotel in Orlando, and also here's some photo booth stuff. I was talking about photo booths earlier. Um, and also I did the um, Disney's Animal Kingdom, which was a really um, unique experience seeing um, behind the scenes, seeing the, um, the uh, I got a little traffic jam. Uh, okay, this, you know, I didn't see this the other day, Plinko, different games, this looks kind of interesting. Um, and these are, wow, these are like physical, right? So these are not video game stuff. You know, that, that could be a key if you're thinking about designing your own game or whatever. I mean, it looks like they have maybe motors on these. But, you know, if you're thinking about a game and you want to compete with all the other games out there or like the video-based stuff, then maybe, you know, you have to go backwards in tech. Um, and the reason for, you know, that would be uh, you know, you're, you're standing out from the crowd just in terms of something that's different because everyone's expecting a, uh, you know, video game based VR, AR kind of experience. Um, dis disinfection stuff, you know, the, the practical stuff you get IIF is key, right? I think a lot of times we think it's this stuff, right? But it really is this stuff as well. Uh, if you're running a theme park, and I worked uh, at Six Flags Astroworld in the theme park industry, if you're running a theme park, you know, sometimes it's the practical stuff that's make or break. Lines, queuing, disinfection, safety, uh, mechanical kinds of things. Not just the fun, immersive stuff that everybody thinks about. You know, everyone always reads those Disney books and says, oh, I want to be an Imagineer, I want to design theme park rides. But nobody ever says, I want to design the disinfection systems for water parks or something. 
Uh, and they should, right? Because clearly, that's a big part of the industry and we forget about it. Now, um, this giant snow globe, uh, two years ago, they, uh, I could have sworn it was bigger, but maybe it was the same size. I know it was a more prominent um, location on the trade, shore, uh, trade floor. So um, it's the same setup, but um, you know, different location. So the giant snow globe ball. I mean, we all remember maybe as kids. Uh, now we get into some bigger rides and this could get exciting. Uh, so in this case, looks like, you know, it's not a working ride, but it's, you know, part of it. Whereas here we get into some actual working rides. But maybe see if any of these are gonna work. Um, here's all the inflatables. We're just moving. Uh, so we were, uh, you know, the coin-op games when I was down there, that's the 100, 200s. We're all the way down in the, I believe, 4,000, yeah, 40, 4863. So we're getting uh, towards the end of, uh, you know, getting all the inflatables, some of the rides. I may not take you outside. It's, it's pretty warm today, but uh, in some of my other videos, and I will post those on the YouTube channel, um, you can actually, uh, here, you can see here we're getting more, right, a lot of practical stuff, uh, safety, uh, technologies for ticketing, right, um, queuing, getting, you know, when, when I worked in the theme park industry at um, Six Flags, you know, something like how long it took you to go through a line, was, that was a big deal for people. Um, so, you know, we can't lose sight of that. We can't lose sight of all the kind of, you know, practical stuff that people maybe don't think about in terms of amusements, but certainly should, right? Something as, something as simple, right, as, you know, the color of tile you use or the bricks or whatever. Um, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it, it actually makes a big difference even though it's often something you don't see. It's the, equivalent of the film industry where there's all these people behind the scenes the gaffers the grips all those people that are working on the set design doing cleanup doing catering they're all part of the team but they never get they never get the actual credit right and i think the same thing happens in the industry we think of the rides and the cool vr attractions we don't think of the stone the tile the stuff that really does uh, make a difference in terms of the experience of the guest. So it's, you know, a bit of a um, perspective, I think, to have. I realize we're getting um, constant cut out of the video. Um, you know, it's my first uh, day today doing Facebook live casting. I tried with YouTube and failed miserably. The app just didn't seem to work. So um, I don't know. I, today, the issue is not battery life for the app. It just seems to be the Wi-Fi. So we are doing what we can and I think Facebook will catch up and you of course can always uh, watch this either on Facebook or get some cool lights here or on my YouTube which is more reliable a lot of my edited stuff um, videos from IAPA I'm also going to be taking you through this you through uh, Disney Springs got some amazing LED lights uh, so Disney Springs uh, I, you know, I, I visited with uh, Gordon Grice uh, from Florac we presented this morning on sensory design for those of you watching. And um, so I'll take you through Disney Springs and talk about the transformation from downtown Disney to uh, Disney Springs with the new narrative. Um, it was an interesting uh, experience Gordon and I had. We spent like 10 hours there just going through, talking to a couple of the um, WDI, the Imagineering folks, and just really getting a perspective on how Disney took all these disparate elements from a mall that over time, to say the least, has had challenges, maybe not unlike uh, California Adventure in some ways, and how they gave it a backstory, a narrative. And it's a historical one, and um, the more I think about it, you know, I would say it's a postmodern sort of narrative in terms of time, in terms of how they deal with reuse. Uh, a settler's cabin becomes a um, burger bar in, in uh, present day. So this is another bowling experience. And then here we have a soccer experience, a football experience. Uh, again, at IAPA, you'll get a range, uh, you'll get full-fledged rides, functioning rides like this one here. So we'll see if the people will wave at us. I don't know, hello. Uh, 
Um, again, it's not something, you know, I, I was posting some stuff on Facebook today about academic conferences, and I'm not trying to, you know, cast shade on academic conferences, but one of the things that I never like about academic conferences is there's so much, there's so much posturing, there's so much, you know, sense of abstraction in terms of the presentations. And you, you come to IAPA, you present, and certainly if you're in the trade hall, right? There's, there's none of that, and I just, I really appreciate it. And, I, and it's not to say I don't do academic conferences anymore, but less and less I find them interesting just because I am not, I'm at a point in my career where I don't really care about, you know, pedigree or lineage or recognition. I mean, well, we all do to some extent, right? We all care about, we all care about some sort of approach we might have. I want people to read our work. And I was kind of uh, excited today. I had a, a young student, a sociologist, who bought Theme Park, which I saw as in a new edition, uh, like a glossier cover. And, um, he, you know, we talked a little bit about social science, and we talked about, you know, the industry. We talked about criticism, Theme Park criticism. It's those kinds of conversations I enjoy having at IAPA because I feel like, in addition to the lack of uh, pretentiousness, you know, people truly are here to do a variety of things. People do want to uh, talk. People do want to talk research. People do want to uh, talk about, uh, of course, the practical things as well. But they're just there's a real collaborative feel to it, and I've always just appreciated. I think that um, sensibility at IAPA. Just trying to decide where to walk. Now again, we're in the 5800, so we're just at the um, extreme. Um, and we're entering inflatable territory and again if you go to the opposite end, the 100s your coin op and video games um, these leds those are bright wow stare at those a while uh, here's another ride it's the drop and twist all right drop and twist the drop and twist there. We're getting some cut out. Again, my, it's not my Wi-Fi, it's IAPA's, and unfortunately, um, we're, we're getting that drop out. But with 32,000 folks here, who knows how many are on the Wi-Fi right now. I don't know what their bandwidth is, but that is blinding. Wow. Uh, LEDs have, have really revolutionized uh, the industry. And you know, so this morning, I was having a conversation. There were so many cool um, students at our uh, panel this morning, and someone asked me a question about VR, augmented reality, um, 4D, 5D, however many D rides. And I said, you know, one of the things we lose, I think, in conversations in the music industry or about theme parks, museums, is that sense of um, the aesthetic side of presentation. And I'm seeing the LEDs, and I'm actually thinking of the whole issue of installations right from the world of art um, if you doesn't have to be the MoMA but you you go to, to you go to any great art gallery in most parts of the world right could be a small town even you're gonna find some use of technology you're gonna find in fact some of the same devices and delivery systems um, optical systems video uh, you know in the amusement park world as you might in museums, and of course, for the museum uh, folks out there, one of the issues is how do you negotiate this uh, cross talk between um, the you know, I, I don't like edutainment, but I don't necessarily like the word edutainment, but the educational side of what you're trying to do in a museum and the entertainment or immersive side. We've got, we've got a little, let's see. Those, you know, I saw these, uh, if we're getting, I'm getting covered here in, is it foam? Hopefully this is not hazardous. I'm sure they figured this out. The kids love it, right? The kids love this. We're getting covered in it. Let's see. Oh, it, it's kind of just dissipating. So it looks like it's uh, some kind of foam and it's uh, dissipating, so we're not going to have any residue presumably left over but um, you know so there's a side right that in the industry like the museum folks are always talking about we don't want to compromise the didactic the pedagogical the educational the emotional um, that side of immersion 
for entertainment. And, you know, I, going to the Teen Entertainment Association conferences, Tia, you get an interplay. Sorry, we're getting loud here. We're in the inflatables. And we have uh, the fans, right? The blow up stuff. By the way, here are some prices. I talked about this earlier. Foosball. Actually, let's go inside for an experience. It's the dance bar. All right. you enjoy that or not but you know it's not too big right so you could probably if you had a small theme park I mean look at that it's not super big so you could set up your own marquee dance club um I don't know it's kind of cool but it's not it's not as bad as maybe it seems here's the tiki bar I, I did a little thing the other day I said on uh, my new reader on theme immersive spaces I have a piece called the cultures of tiki uh, for those of you out there who love tiki uh, come out to IAPA 5862 for the inflatable tiki bar for a bargain price of $18.99. So not, not bad actually for a tiki bar. I actually think a customer, just a person who doesn't own, hey, if you watch Rectify, you know this, right? Rectify, and if you watch Rectify, Sundance, kind of a, a mini character in terms of some of the drama there. Rectify, um, very good. Uh, drama about uh, a man who's released from prison and his family and whoa this is I did not see this Tuesday it's an inflatable yacht that's pretty that's pretty darn amazing so yeah in rectify you know there's sort of a a few quite a few scenes with the car dealership and the uh, blow up I don't know what you call those things but the blow up uh, uh, dudes whatever they're called um, but yeah, so you know, in the world of uh, museum design, I think people have a concern about not veering too much uh, into the world of uh, entertainment and immersion or technology for technology or immersion's sake, and instead try to say, well, let's use some of that to connect with guests, but let's still focus on our mission to educate, to teach, to change, to transform. I mentioned a little bit in my talk today about um, Marcel Proust and, and memory and evocative memories brought on by the senses because Gordon Joel and I were talking about sensory design and I said you know Proust reminds us that and, and it's a classic story from Remembrance of Things Past where he dips a, a little cookie or a cake in some tea and has this you know memory of his childhood and not all the memories he speaks of if you could make it through the seven volumes of his masterpiece um, not all of those are necessarily uh, positive memories so here's another um, I'm not you know it'd be interesting to see this actually operating and you know so far it's just I don't know there aren't actually I guess people in it but uh, you know it's just another opportunity to see the uh, the technology here's some kind of zero air pad with zero shock technology There's actually a person, whoa. So there's a person, like, I didn't see that. You see those hands? I mean, she's doing flips and, oh, you know, it's probably they're getting some social media. Probably they don't mind if we're taking photos or video because I've, ta you know, I've talked about IAPA and a couple booths, people have gave me dirty lucks because I'm taking video or they actually have signs, go figure, signs that say nothing uh, short of do not take photos and I'm always making the point that if you are in the industry and you're trying to publicize your product in this case the AirPad zero shock technology you want people to post this to social media you want people to post this to Instagram you don't want it to be like I, I, I just I don't get it the no photos thing I will never understand why anyone puts that photo up um, if, you, if you do not understand the world of social media and the viral nature of how we communicate images. I mean, you don't have to read uh, Guy Debord, The Society of the Spectacle, to understand that, yeah, we are indeed mediated by images, and not just images, but real time. I mean, this morning we were talking about AI, artificial intelligence technologies in terms of sound design. 
it's a crazy, crazy world we live in now. Not just in terms of amusements, but of course, technology, social media, etc. So here on the right, yesterday I was talking about if I'm getting political, which I'm not. Political button, not depressed, but. If I were, I would talk about uh, gun culture, American obsession with guns. Uh, if you read my piece, actually, in uh, the reader, forget the name of it, uh, Joystick Soldiers, I did a piece uh, in, in there on um, guns culture at IAPA, where people are fascinated with shooting games. And I understand that, but a side of me thinks, like, the United States needs to have a conversation sometime. <laughs> about our obsession with weapons. And just as I'm saying that, we have some kind of weapons. Although, you know, those are maybe a little less problematic. I guess if the weapons don't look like real guns, maybe I'm a little less concerned. I don't know. But, you know, it, it's something for us to have a conversation about, you know, in terms of entertainment. So what this appears to be is um, full motion, wireless, multiplayer, virtual reality. Um, I don't know. I bet I couldn't just get... I'd, I'd love to try this out later. Uh, there's a new place, and some of the folks on Facebook will remember. Uh, Denver, Colorado. Is it called? It's not the zone. Not called the zone. I'm forgetting it. I'll, I will think of it later. But basically, it is similar to this, where it's fully immersive. You're moving around. Um, it's going to be hard for us to tell what's happening. Let's see if we get any screens here. We do have screens. Um... So what I'm interested in is, you know, what is the player seeing? And I don't know if we'll actually be able to view any of that. That would be pretty, that would be interesting if we could see that. Uh, this is, looks like some sort of futuristic sci-fi theme to it. Uh, okay, wow, we are getting this. So maybe we, let's try it real time. Let's get a, so look, we're getting, you can see there, right? We've got the avatars. They're each named. And I'm trying to see, oh, nine. Let me look for nine. Where's nine? Because, um, see, they have numbers on their packs. So what I'm thinking is maybe we could watch, you know, someone in real time is moving. We get their avatar up on the screen. So, again, we can't exactly see what they're experiencing. But this is a pretty cool opportunity to maybe see how this works. Okay, so I'm trying to imagine. So I'm thinking they're seeing this particular landscape, right? So now they're experiencing, I'm trying to see if they're gonna actually, okay, they're walking. I can't, I can't really show you both at the same time, but people are kind of stumbling, right? So they're walking, yeah, so that, that is pretty amazing. So it looks like they're walking in this pen, this ring. Again, it's pretty, pretty expansive, right? I mean, it's not a small footprint. And um, that is then being translated to what they're doing um, in the, the virtual version. It looks like, so, I saw it, looks like, uh, I wonder if this guy here is Spencer on the screen. Because it looked like he was shooting his weapon. They are shooting, okay. Um, okay, so, you know, it, it's just not, you know, it's one of these things, right, we have to try it. but. I like the intent of this because the fact that you're moving in this pen, if you've done any VR stuff um, where you're sort of trapped on a podium or something, there's sometimes no bigger than the screening device at an airport, right? Where you're in this little device and you're trying to feel the experience, but if you can actually like move around and fully interact, in this case we're talking, what do you think that is, 100 maybe or at least 50 feet, 70 feet long? 15, 20 feet wide, that's a pretty good expanse to move around. Now, this guy's moving. Let's see what he's doing. Um, again, what I would love to be able to do is to see which character is which. Now, they're looking down. Okay, so let's, let's see here. So they're looking. See, as they're looking down, those look like pretty um, very... I, I don't know what the technology is, but you can tell they're raising their weapons. So yeah, I mean definitely, so they look up, they presumably see the sky as we're seeing it on their screens, and then they look down and they see the ground. So, th you know, th this, I, I think this is, uh, has some real potential. For those of us certainly studying video games, I think the interesting thing here is this idea that more and more your body uh, is connecting to what's happening in the virtual world. 
Um, if you know, um, you know, folks like Tom uh, Belsdorf or people study uh, Second Life, which you know isn't this kind of game or virtual experience. You know, Second Life, I think, was an interesting opportunity to think about um, inhabiting a real world or, or a virtual world through our real selves. But you know that that interface that's going on, I think, is very limited. You're you're moving stuff on a keyboard or whatever. Look at these guys. They're actually, right? They're looking down at the ground again. I should look at the screen to see. What I'm trying to do is figure out, you know, which character is which here on the screen. Because I think what's cool about this is, and they're walking. Okay, let's look on the screen. They're just moving through a portal, and so it appears to be like, okay, yeah, look at this. So it looks like there are sensors on the guns and so you can tell when someone moves the gun up or down their head moving up and down that is all being translated right in real time as information in the virtual world so I think what we're getting into uh, those of you who know you know motion capture and film you know sometimes you have hundreds of points that are captured uh, on a person's body wearing a suit or through the environment in some way um, if you increase then the number of points on the weapon, on um, you know the helmet, on the Oculus type VR glasses, then I think what you do is you increase that level potential of immersion or interaction uh, that's happening via the, the game itself. So for me, this is kind of exciting because again, it, it's suggesting that where this guy's actually running, um, and that would be cool to try this out to see if as you're running, you know, um, how, how it's keeping up. Is there any latency? You know, the latency effect is something we talk about in the music world. Um, it, it's certainly something to consider, I think, in uh, motion capture, in VR, because you want to feel as if what you're doing physically with your body is translating right to um, the experience on the screen in the virtual world. So that's what I think is pretty exciting about this is new range of, of motion, um, new um, ranges of opportunity to capture the nuances of the body. And as this technology increases, what will certainly happen is then we'll have our feet, right? We'll be strapped up to something. We'll have more parts of our body interacting with the space. Um, we get the processing power of the, the computing system going. We do all the sensory stuff. Again, I'm not listening to the sound. I'm not experiencing the visual. But you know, if we control those elements, we increase the number of touch points or interaction points that we have, um, that's gonna make for some pretty exciting, I think, interactive opportunities. So um, I probably spent like 15 minutes here, but you know, it's one of those things when I see that, I'm like, okay, this, this, we're seeing a little bit of the future here in terms of interactive design. Um, and what's cool about something like that, before I move on, is you, know, you, it, you can customize, right? So if I'm operating a theme park or a World's Fair Expo space, and don't forget the Expo space, its relevance to this, for those of you that study the World Expo Forum, you know, I'm actually not seeing enough. I was at the, the uh, Expo in Milan, 2015. I went through every single pavilion, except for Japan, which ironically enough was supposedly one of the most interactive ones with virtual food uh, systems. <clears throat> but I didn't see enough of this stuff going on. What I saw was, you know, go to the whatever country pavilion, put on your Oculus glasses, and look, you get to see a famous church. The opposite example, earlier I was talking about the idea that we're gonna sacrifice the story for the technology, for the, I, I almost say the cheapness, the fabricated nature of the immersiveness, the technology. We have cases, I would say at the expo, where we're doing the opposite. We are focusing just on the story as a static thing, as an entity, you know, a, a, a static thing. And we're cutting out a little bit. I apologize for that, the Wi-Fi. Uh, but you sacrifice for the story. You basically say, I'm not going to use technology available. Instead, I will just put up a static display, a plaque, and the guest is going to be entertained by reading a static display. So um, that doesn't work either. It's a balance between the two realms of the immersive technological VR and the storytelling, the narrative, the didactic, all that kind of stuff. You know, this this reminds me of how, you know, we, we just came from this, right? We just came from the VR experience. That has a 
what we call corporeal bodily experience, right? My body's a part of it. This though, I think, is reminding us that we can focus on physicality as part of the experience. And kids love this, they eat this up, right? You put in the uh, dirt, there is going to be a, uh, I, I don't know, their thing here, but it looks like, uh, you know, different uh, fossils or petrified wood, etc. And kids play with this, or adults. And, you're, you know, this is, you're literally getting your hands wet, you know, right? Like you are literally touching something, it's tactile. Sand has a particular tactile nature to it. Water, there's a thermo perception thing happening with water. Gordon was talking about this morning, discussing the senses, and, and really uh, he was on to something because I think we often want to just do the VR moment when we could be doing this moment. And, and I, I don't ever think that we should take this and turn it into a virtual. Oh, by the way, actually there is, there is a virtual version of this. I kid you not, panning for gold, just down the way. I don't know if we'll run into it, but uh, I don't want to say it's boring because I'm not trying to, uh, you know, cast aspersions in terms of different rides and stuff. But let me just say I was a little more engaged by that one back there and not the virtual version. But that's just me. It's subjective, right? Uh, you know, I talked this morning. My talk. We're looking at some more decor stuff. Um, we get all the world represented here: cultures, nations. I was, I was discussing on my talk today that. Um, via Proust, that there's a subjective nature of um, the realities, the virtual realities, the worlds we create um, in theme parks, in museums, in every type of attraction represented by IAPA. And in that sense, you know, it, it ties back to the, uh, the anthropologist in me where I say, we need to talk to folks about their experiences. If you're doing... Oh, you know, I had some of these... Should we queue? Let's queue. I'm going to get a French fry. Uh, so, I, you know, my two, uh, I don't know if this is the line. I think it is. I was talking actually in my talk today about the mini donuts. Um, so I was going to queue to have a French fry here. Uh, if you're watching, I guess you just have to experience, right, the sensory, sensory side of this without actually trying the french fry. They're pretty good. I tried them two years ago, if they're the same company. We have, looks like cinnamon, maple, sour cream, onion. Uh, you know, I tried the, actually a ketchup one. I think I tried that one. We got the barbecue. Okay, so let's see. Hopefully these aren't the used toothpicks. Uh, let us go for, I think we'll just try the, uh, okay. Let's try flame grilled barbecue. All right, so let's see how that is. Uh, you have to take my word for it. You can watch some cool, whatever that is, special effects equipment. And, um, 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 um that's, that's very good. That's very good. Um, good crispiness, mm, you know, kind of that European palm frites kind of uh, experience. So, um, I'm gonna use a toothpick here for some sort of effect. Try the french fries at Ayapa. Um, the donuts as well. So, I, you know, I talked about the donut this morning twice in my talk. I, it seems like, um, it seems like every talk I do. At app, I'm talking about these mini donuts, so I'm going to try to find those. We're looking at the blast zone. If you're doing your own little home party, maybe you could uh, create your own experience. That's, yeah, it's pretty cool. If you are into, like, DIY, Arduino, you know, the whole maker world uh, that that would be a fun which reminds me i've never i've never been to a maker fuss because that's that's a whole other world of of interest and creativity and technology but you know there's a lot of stuff here just from a technological uh, side that i think is is just fascinating you know how do they make that and uh, for someone like me who doesn't have any mechanical tech i i guess i have a technological side with audio video but um you know i just see some of that stuff and it's just it's an it's amazing just to uh see everything that's available, you know, ranging from 
everything you, you see at IAPA, practical stuff, um, functional things, immersive things, and so forth. Um, oh, I was talking about stream of consciousness. You know, I was talking about Proust this morning and tea and a cookie and memory and all this stuff related to the senses. And I thought to myself, it's like every, um, I've done two IAPA talks, 2015 and, and this year, and it seems like every year, I'm um, yes. looking at some more rides here, I, I bring up those donuts. So I, I, I like, I feel like for the um, 11, I, we're up to a, 1,200 people now watching. Wow, we've doubled uh, in size, so. Um, and you, and you can choose whether to, to believe my numbers there. But uh, a couple years ago, I talked about these mini donuts. I talked about them this year. And I, my excuse this year is I was talking about Proust and the memory. we got some loud sounds. What's happening here? Aeroball. I don't know what that is. Um, so my excuse is I, I'm always talking about the mini donuts because in this case, uh, I was thinking about memory. I was thinking about... Um, experience and taste and you know so I, I covered uh, Gordon did visual the five senses okay you know shouldn't say that all cultures experience five senses we did it we talked about five senses in a practical sense because we obviously wanted to um, go through the senses and then talk about them in the context of spatial design and then people workshopped for unfortunately not enough, enough time but it was a a cool workshop. Um, so Gordon covered visual as a critique, basically saying, and he's again an architect, an architectural illustrator, and he was basically saying that the visual is over relied upon in another mini bowling game here. Um, it's over relied upon in the world of architecture, theme parks, museums. He also um, talked about some dark restaurant experiences. Those are kind of the, a big thing. Oh, check out this owl. So we, uh, Gordon and I looked at this today. This owl is really cool. Look at just what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful animal. No, go ahead. You're fine. Please. Beautiful animal. Look at that. See live animals at Iapa. Well, that's that's really, just really amazing to see all this. Um, brochures, by the way, if you come to Iapa, you can get brochures uh as many brochures as you want you know that's obviously a big part of a, a trade show and all trade shows i think have a component of this so if you go to um nam you know the big music industry convention or the home electronics i think that's always done in chicago you're gonna you're gonna see a similarity in terms of oh, sorry we're back um idea attack they do amazing stuff by the way i was saying earlier with some of the big Bigger firms represent. Um, I was saying with some of the bigger firms represented here, you know, you often see just very minimal project stuff going on, and then you get this meeting space, right? So you can meet with clients. Uh, sometimes they have back rooms and stuff, and it's like you know, it's kind of really where deals are brokered, etc. But anyway, I was saying you know, in any trade show, you're going to see products, you're going to see mock-ups, you're going to see all this stuff. You're going to get um, the handouts, the brochures, the demos, the video screens. So it has, you know, IAPA has that in common with other trade shows. The difference being um, this is the amusement industry and so the products of course are tailored to that. Uh, again, you know, I said earlier here, booth 2936, you know, when, when you come out to IAPA, um, 2935, right, this stuff, we think of the rides. We don't think of the engineering side of things. We don't think, we don't think of, well actually we probably think of this. Okay, are you as bothered as I am right now? I don't know. Something is... I think they're singing... Were they singing Babushka? Wow. I think they were singing Babushka, which is a headscarf, right? If you're uh, Slovakian as I am, you maybe know that. Um, I don't know. You know, so I was going to say that was the Uncanny Valley operating. Uh, the Uncanny Valley being like, well, that's not the Uncanny Valley. Because the Uncanny Valley is, there's too much of a likeness of the simulacrum, the robot, the avatar. And 
too much of a simulate uh, too much of a similarity between the robot and ourselves. So in this case, it's not. I think it maybe just as uh, I don't know singing animals. If that's not your thing, if you go to um, Jungle Gems, the themed food store in the theme food store outside of uh, Cincinnati. Uh, they actually have those, not those same versions, but they have singing robots. So I, I, there's something about performing cartoon type robots. Oh, this is funny. Look at that. Uh, this is very funny. So uh, everyone gets a tag at IAPA and I have, I tracked down my speaker tag, but again, uh, you know, some of us have these non-member buyer tags. I'm not a buyer, but um, others, you know, are member exhi uh, exhibitors, if I can say that. And this is kind of funny, right? Because they were giving Bigfoot um, his or her own, I don't know, is Bigfoot male or female? I don't know. Probably non-gender specific. Uh, but yeah, giving Bigfoot his or her own tag. That's pretty cool. Um, these guys are a big ride manufacturer. They do like really, they've been around forever. I mean, just really historic. Back in the old days when I was a graduate student studying this stuff, reading about rides and so forth, um, you know, I was always reading about the big players and their big players. Um, let's see, who else we have represented? You know, Whitewater, they do um, amazing stuff. And every year they've got like, I think it was even bigger last year, but they have, um, they have this like, so sorry, I didn't mean to uh, do that. If you were watching, you got cut off. Uh, for some reason, I hit finish, and uh, it did post the video. But um, they, you know, Whitewater, they always do like this major um, booth every year, and uh, just I, I'm always wondering how much it costs to exhibit. Um, if you're a vendor, if you're you know trying to sell a ride or whatever. So I lost people. I'm so sorry that uh, if you were watching the 999 people watching. Um, it's like more mobile. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested. I haven't seen as much at IAPA in terms of uh, apps, but I'm interested in like apps and, and wearables, uh, wearable technology and so forth. Continuing, I think we were here this morning, this section, playing some of these games. It seems like I've been talking for hours now, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's just so much to see at IAPA that if you're doing a trade tree, you can't do it in a day. There's, there's no way, really, if you want to see everything. Um, you know, if you're coming here for business or something like that, you can be very targeted and specific to where you want to go, who you're going to meet. You know, it's it's so easy. Just go to the map, look for the vendor, and uh, it's kind of a piece of cake to find your way and to discover or talk to the people you want to talk to. I was thinking, I want to actually, like, go inside something. Um, but I don't know how that would work as far as taking you inside for a spin. Liquid fireworks. Yeah, it's really cool. So, you know, what I like about AF is every year we're seeing, you know, different, you know, variations on uh, everything from lighting to sensory uses of water in that case. Uh, of course, all the VR and the technological stuff. GRA, they're a big player in um, design. Yeah, when, when you read about a lot of these ride companies or firms, you know, like uh, as a graduate student, then you get to actually experience, like, the companies. Um, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's very cool. And again, you see a little bit of the legacy of these companies and their rides, their attractions, uh, the styles even, you know, like, 
when you study, going back to Bob Cartmel's uh, book on roller coasters, you know, I think people again lose sight of the uh, the art historical side of uh, amusement rides. So if you experience a ride and see it, you know, in an aesthetic sense, that obviously allows you. You see, you know, another side of rides that I think is often missed uh, on the public in terms of, you know, understanding that ride. I see different costumed performers coming out. I don't know what they're associated with, but there are a lot of people. Okay, sorry. So we cut out a second there. I was what I did was I posted the uh, the the 30 minutes or so that I just um, had going. So and I probably lost a bunch of people, um, but I just wanted to make sure basically that we had uh, had something archived of the experience. Did you see all those people out there with pencils? Yeah, they might be the ones from pencil base. <laughs> All right, so I think I, maybe I lost. I think we're down to 997 viewers now. But um, I may have lost a few people. But I, what I did was I wanted to post the uh, the current, um, get an archive going of the current uh, video just to make sure that we have that. Uh, we got a lot. We've got um, audio animatronics. Anyway, I was just saying we have um, audio animatronics, and uh, actually, of course, they're not really. You know, audio animatronic. Uh, the name is a uh, trademark of, of Disney, right? All Disney Imagineering. So we we need a better. You know, they're not robots, right? Because they talk and they interact and everything. So we need a better uh, better name for them, right? Um, escape rooms are a really big deal. I recently did an escape room, my very first one in uh, South Lake Tahoe. And what's pretty cool about the escape room, and if you follow what they involve, uh, they started, you know, maybe around the mid-2000s. Um, Japan, Singapore, for sure, when I was in Singapore. 